All right. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for all your blessings. We thank you for this day and this opportunity to gather again. Um, pray, Lord, that you would be with us. Um, guide our discussion tonight as we continue to study your word um, from a different angle. Uh, Lord, help us to become more confident and steadfast in our faith and to uh, understand it even better than before through the intercessions of all your saints who please you from the beginning here says we say our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us lead us not to temptation but deliver us from the evil one to christ jesus our lord for thine is kingdom the power and the glory forever and ever amen all right, welcome everybody. So we are on our study of taking, looking critically at Christ. And our whole goal behind this is to, in you know, we always do Bible study, but now we want to study the Bible and understand it because the Bible is under attack in our present day and age. Um, a lot of people write it off as a book of fairy tales and myths, but um, when you actually look closer, there's a lot more to the scripture that gives it a lot of credibility. And of course, our credit, our desire to bring credibility to the Bible, um, all sets us up to be able to declare with confidence the teachings of our Lord. But even more than that, to really declare His resurrection and what it has done for you and me. And so, in our study so far, we looked at the the, the Gospels. Um, in our week one, last week, we looked at outside sources that. Um, that gave us a historical picture of who Jesus was, all right? And I'm going to open up by sharing a quote from last week. Does everybody uh, see the slides? The slide? Okay, thank you. All right. um, and when we look... A uh, quote from last week, you know, the big question was we looked at all these different um, uh, historical authors from kind of the first century to the second century, and they were non-Christian um, authors, and we were just saying from their writings, well, what can we glean about who Jesus Christ was, right? And when we look at one of the quotes from a historian, he's a professor at the uh, University of Miami of Ohio, he said, we would still have a considerable amount of important historical evidence about Jesus without the New Testament. In fact, it would provide a kind of outline for the life of Jesus. We would know that first, Jesus was a Jewish teacher. Second, many people believe that he performed healings and exorcisms. Third, some people believed he was the Messiah. Fourth, he was rejected by the Jewish leaders. Fifth, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate in the reign of Tiberius. Sixth, despite the shameful death, his followers, who believed that he was still alive, spread beyond, beyond Palestine so that there were multitudes of them in Rome by 64 AD. And seventh, all kinds of people from the cities, countryside, men and women, slave and free, worshipped him as God, right? And, and so this is the information that we can get from just examining the historical accounts of who Jesus Christ was, right? And understanding who history says he was is really important because, you know, we, when history lines up with the account of the gospel, it brings a lot of credibility to the gospel. But if the gospel is portraying Jesus, a, you know, historical figure in one way, and the historical accounts of him are different, then, then we got an issue. And we do see that in one area, which is the Gnostic Gospels, or the Gospels that proclaim to say, like, we have a hidden knowledge of who Jesus is, right, which was a whole heresy in, in first couple centuries. And, and what we see is that the church, which was, you know, the body of believers, it was very easy for the church to say, oh, these Gnostic Gospels are, are phony writings. They're, they falsify the picture of who Jesus is. And these four Gospels are the, are the credible ones, right? And that's what the church chose to use um, 
as the four gospels and that's what ultimately made it into the canon of the new testament which we have and so we see how these are really accurate and credible documents for us to look at um, when when studying the person of jesus christ and we see from last week that it really does match up with the historical picture of who jesus is all right but now what we want to do this week is now take a closer look at christ so we looked at the gospels all right and and are they credible and then we looked at the outside evidence, and, and now we're going to take an, a closer look at Jesus Christ, how he walked when he was here, all right? So like every week, we got a cool video, and if you don't hear the sound, please let me know um, soon so I can stop it and fix it. It was one of Chicago's most infamous murders. Eight student nurses were slain in an apartment complex more than 40 years ago. The murderer fled the scene, threw his weapons into the river, and sought treatment at a hospital for some injuries. He thought he could get away with the murders because no one had seen him commit the crime. But his plan unraveled when it was revealed that a ninth nurse had hidden under a bed witnessed the killings and was able to give police a description of the killer. Police distributed a sketch based on her account and an emergency room physician who was treating Richard Speck was able to identify him as the slayer. Ever since Scotland Yard first disseminated the drawing of a murder suspect in 1889, sketch artists have been taking the recollections of witnesses and creating a likeness of the suspect. Most sketch artists today have been replaced by technology as many police officers are trained on computer systems to create photo-like images of criminals. In a way, the Old Testament contains a descriptive sketch of the likeness of God based on his attributes and characteristics. Now, Jesus claims to be divine, but how well does his likeness fit this sketch in the Old Testament? That's what we're going to explore in this fascinating session today. to the claims that Jesus makes about himself in the New Testament, there are also reports that he performed the miraculous, that he walked on water and healed the sick and turned water into wine and, and raised the dead and did exorcisms. And so I had to know, uh, is there evidence that these miracles are a result of his divine nature? Jesus's contemporaries, that is people who liked him, people who were indifferent, neutral, and people who opposed him all acknowledged he did extraordinary things. Now, of course, the people who liked Jesus and believed in him and followed him said, Jesus did these powerful works because of the spirit of God. People who opposed him would say, well, I admit he does these amazing things, but it's because the devil is helping him. The Talmud actually speaks of some of these things in some of the passages that deal with Yeshua. It has him as a, well, a magician. And why do they describe him as a magician? It's, it, it's not flattering. There's a historical recognition here that when Yeshua came, he did miracles, just as Isaiah 35 indicates in the Messianic age, when the Messiah comes, he'll be able to make the blind see and the lame walk. The New Testament gospels record at least 40 separate miracles performed by Jesus during the course of his ministry. They include healings, exorcisms, mastery over nature, and even raising of the dead. Christian theology has always held that these miracles are part of a total picture that displays the attributes of God himself, unlimited power, total knowledge, ever-present, unchanging, eternal. There's no question that the biographies of Jesus describe him as a worker of mighty deeds. 
But I wanted to know, does this make him any different than the other miracle workers and magicians of the ancient world? Miracle workers that we find occasionally in the first century uh, are magicians. They use incantations, they use spells, they, they try to coerce um, gods or divine figures to work on their behalf. That's very different than Jesus' miracles. Jesus' his miracles were to demonstrate the power of the kingdom of God. When he healed the sick, he pointed back to Isaiah prophecies that when God's kingdom would come, when God's salvation would come, the lame would walk, the blind would see. This was the demonstration that God's kingdom was arriving. He's an exorcist. You don't find any of those in the Old Testament. People were not looking for messianic exorcists. He carves out his own niche. He reveals his identity in his own way. It becomes clear that he is somebody who can take on the powers of darkness himself and win. What kind of person is that? And he doesn't have to use recipes and formulas like other ancient exorcists. He can just call the demon by name and that boy's out of there. One of the most astonishing things that Jesus did was when he claimed to forgive sins. In Mark's Gospel, chapter 2, a man is brought to him, um, a paralyzed man. And the crowds around him are expecting Jesus to heal him. But instead, the first thing Jesus said is, your sins are forgiven. Only God forgives sins. Now, some might say, well, Jesus may have been forgiving sins on behalf of God. But in fact, that's not the way his listeners understood him, because immediately the religious leaders responded to that. Who is this that forgives sins? Only God forgives sins, they claim. But Jesus claims the ability to forgive sins. And then to confirm that he has that authority, he then heals the man. And so a very obvious question arises. That is, is Jesus the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one, the one sent by God to be the savior of Israel and the world? Christians told me that there are dozens and dozens of ancient prophecies contained in the Old Testament of the Bible, and that they predict the coming of this Messiah, and that Jesus, against all the medical odds, fulfill those prophecies. And I thought, you know, this is a little bit like the fingerprint evidence you see in a court of law. I remember covering one particular case where the murderer went through the purse of the victim and he left one thumbprint on the cellophane wrapper of a package of cigarettes. And it was that thumbprint that led to his conviction for murder. And I thought in an analogous way, could it be that these ancient prophecies are sort of like that thumbprint on the cellophane? Do they create a thumbprint that only Jesus Christ in all of history manages to match? This is Yashiyahu 53.6, or Isaiah 53.6. Kulanu katson ta'inu, ishladarko paninu, badonai hifnia bo, eit avon kulanu. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. I had a friend who wrote this out on a piece of paper. He typed it up on his computer without any verse notations. And he took it around to everyone uh, in his office. He worked in a big office for a motor vehicle bureau in one of the big states in our country. And he showed it to everyone in the motor vehicle bureau and uh, in the state capitol. And he said, just tell me who this is and where it comes from. And every single person that looked at it, Jew or Gentile alike, it didn't matter. Everyone that looked at it read it and he said, who is this? They said, Oh, it's obviously Jesus of Nazareth. That's who it is. And it's from the New Testament. And then my friend would say, but no, it's not from the New Testament. It's from the Hebrew Bible. It was written eight centuries before Jesus came. Can you believe this? And he showed it to them from Isaiah. And people really had a hard time because if you read this passage without any kind of presuppositions or bias, you will read it and it will be really clear that this is the life of, of Yeshua. Now, could he have fabricated this or is this just a big coincidence? 
In the Old Testament, we really have two kinds of prophecies. We have prophecies that are fulfilled uniquely in Christ and prophecies that are fulfilled typologically in Christ. And I do think we need to distinguish between the two. Uh, those that are fulfilled uniquely in Christ were, were once and for all fulfilled by Jesus. And those are the ones that we can really point to, to have apologetic value. That is to demonstrate that, that Jesus was the only person who could have possibly fulfilled this. His birth in Bethlehem is one of those prophecies. His role as the suffering servant of Isaiah 53 is one of those prophecies. His entrance into Jerusalem on a donkey from Zechariah chapter 9. These are clear evidence that Jesus is fulfilling the Old Testament. The most amazing part of Isaiah's prophecies is in Isaiah 9, which speaks about the son of David coming to be the king, to sit on the throne of David and have an eternal righteous kingdom. And everyone knows it from Handel's Messiah. Unto us a son is born, unto us a child is given. And the idea of this verse is that the Messiah will actually be born, physically born. And then it says, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Father of Eternity. In other words, he's the creator, the author of time. Some skeptics have said that Jesus could have engineered the fulfillment of these prophecies. Of course, Jesus could not have determined where he was going to be born. So to be born in Bethlehem, obviously he could not have engineered that. Also, as the suffering servant, it would have been difficult for him to engineer such a specific fulfillment of Isaiah 53. But on the other hand, the fact that Jesus performed certain actions that in fact fulfilled prophecies only demonstrates that he was indeed the Messiah. Um, anyone who enters Jerusalem riding on a donkey, an obvious fulfillment of Zechariah 9.9 is saying, yes, I am the Messiah. So we certainly have a glimpse in that fulfilled prophecy of the self-consciousness of Jesus, that he truly believed that he was the Messiah. Scholars have determined that Jesus fulfilled at least four dozen major prophecies, each written a minimum of three centuries before his birth. Their content ranged from specific details about his life to the symbolic implications of his death. Psalm 22 gives a poetic picture by David, written in the first person, of what the Messiah will be like in his suffering. And one of the things he says is that they will pierce my hands and my feet. Now, David wrote, before crucifixion was known, probably by about 300 years, so Isaiah 53 says he was pierced through. It gives us the reason for his death. He was pierced through for our iniquities. So there's a purpose. He dies not just because he's a martyr, but because he's a substitution for sin. A college professor of mathematics and science named Dr. Peter Stoner wanted to determine what the odds were that any human being throughout history could fulfill the messianic prophecies. So he had his students come up with very conservative estimates of the likelihood of any human being fulfilling certain of these predictions. And then they just ran the numbers. And what they determined is that the odds of any human being fulfilling 48 of these ancient prophecies would be one chance in a trillion, 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 trillion. It is mathematically virtually impossible. To me, just as significant as all of those unique prophecies that were fulfilled in Christ is the complete drama of the Old Testament. The fact that the Old Testament is the story, the narrative of God's redemptive movement, his movement to deliver and save humanity. And Jesus is the climax of that movement. He is the climax of salvation history, the one who brings it off to fulfillment. You read the Old Testament, it's building, building, building. Uh, Jesus arrives on the scene and he is the fulfillment. And he, he recognizes himself clearly as the climax of God's plan of salvation for all humanity. This whole case was sort of like one of those jigsaw puzzles where you don't know what the ultimate picture is going to be. You just put together the pieces. And it, as I was putting together all of the evidence, it started to take shape. And, and I sort of stepped back and I could see that it was a portrait of Jesus Christ. Clarence Hiller spent the day painting the white trim on the outside of his house. Right. So, I like this video. It was one of my favorite um, of all the videos that we've seen because 
the point that that he brings up at the beginning is like we need to look at the evidence of Jesus Christ and and just ask ourselves like does it all is it leading for us to you know is it leading us to the conclusion that he is the son of God right which is Jesus is is contested maybe not as a historical figure because we have a lot of evidence for him as a historical figure but when we talk to people one of the things that they will question is whether or not he really is the son of God right and that's and that's a question we will have to answer um, people. And so what we're going to do is, is kind of look through things in the scriptures, okay, aspects of the scriptures, to be able to put together an answer when somebody like really wonders whether he is the son of God or not, like, well, how do we use scripture to back that up, right, or to support our argument that truly he was the son of God? All right. And so one of the first things that that I caught from the video that I want to talk about is the authority of Christ. Right. And, and Jesus demonstrated himself to be an individual with authority. Right. And we're going to want to and I want to look at authority in a couple different ways. Right. And the first way that he demonstrated his authority was with respect to how he taught. All right. Let's skip the verse in there. And so he was definitely like, he was known as a teacher, but he was, he taught in a very, very different way because most of the, the scribes of the Pharisees at that time, when they, when they taught, they taught and said like, and so-and-so teacher said this, and then they would go on and say it. And they would always reference somebody else. But when Jesus taught, he taught in a very different way. He taught as if he was the ultimate authority. He wasn't referencing somebody else in the way he taught he taught and that was it right and if we look at uh matthew 7 28 and 29 where it says when jesus had finished saying these things the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as a teacher of the law right so the way he taught was very different than anybody else that we know of in the new testament and even i think i mentioned this in one of the other uh sessions but like even when you look at other, like the um, Buddhism, right? Buddha was a religious figure in, in the Buddhist system who pointed people towards a certain teaching, right? Which is very, very different than Christ. Christ was the teaching, right? And, and this is where Christianity really stands out. So Christ, when he taught, he taught as one who had authority, right? So authority was assumed in the way he taught but he also assumed the authority of god right and and this this is a great quote from a new testament scholar uh, donald carson where he says when david sinned by committing adultery and arranging the death of a woman's husband he ultimately says to god in psalm 51 we know it as psalm 50 against you only have i sinned and done this evil in your sight he being david recognized that although he had wronged people in the end, he had sinned against God who made him in his image, and God needed to forgive him. So along comes Jesus and says to sinners, I forgive you. The Jews immediately recognize the blasphemy of this. They react by saying, who can forgive sins but God alone? To my mind, that is the one that is one of the most striking things Jesus did. And this is like, we read Psalm 50 so frequently within our services, right? And we also like read all these stories about how Jesus went around and he was forgiving sins. And, and, and in kind of like staying or using that authority to give forgiveness of sins, Jesus was in front of everybody equating himself to God, right? Because in the minds of the Jews, the only one who could do that was, was God. God the Father was the only one who could forgive sins. So for Jesus to come along and say, I forgive sins. I forgive your sins. Go and sin no more. Clearly, he was making himself out to be. He was making himself out to be God. All right. So those are two ways that Jesus declared himself to be God. All right. Was through the way he taught and he assumed the authority of God. But clearly, it's, it's pretty easy for anybody to say, I forgive sins. And it's... Uh, 
a mystical or spiritual process of, of what that forgiveness of sins looks like, right? And so very naturally, people would question like, well, who has the ability to forgive sins other than God, right? Which takes us to the story that was referenced um, by one of the, the people in the video, which was the healing of the paralytic, right? In Mark chapter two, where they, they brought the man on a bed, they lowered him from the ceiling. And as he was coming down, he said, you know, your sins are forgiven you. And everybody questioned, like, well, who can forgive sins? Like, how can anybody actually say that? Like, none of the scribes or the Pharisees would say that. They knew in order to forgive sins, you got to take an animal, go to the temple, slaughter the animal. That's how forgiveness of sins works. But for Jesus to say, your sins are forgiven you, clearly this, you know, caught everybody's attention. And so as people were questioning, the, Jesus caught on to this and he responds and he says, which is easier to say? To this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, which anybody can say admittedly, or to say, get up, take up your mat and walk. But I want you to know that I, that, sorry, I want you to know that the son of man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take up your mat and go home. He got up, took up his mat, walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this, right? So Jesus' goal was to instill in people this belief that he has the forgiveness of sins. And it wasn't like by some crafty magic. It was through the action of miracles, right? The miracles gave testimony to who he was claiming to be. Which really brings us to another point that is always going to be contested, right? Miracles. What do we say about miracles? Who believes in miracles? All right. So I'm going to ask you, how would you define a miracle to somebody? How do you define a miracle? An extraordinary act or event that's um, inexplainable somehow. Okay. It so goes beyond like what humans can understand. Great. That I think that's great. An extraordinary act um, or event that happens that goes beyond our ability to explain. You're right. Anybody else want to take a stab? I think that's really good, Carol. I'm just going to add just a little bit to it where it says a special act of God that interrupts the natural course of events, right? So the natural course of events is like how we would see something playing out, but we would define a miracle as a special event or special act of God, right? So we're attributing it to God. That changes the course of events that we would think would play out. Right. So that's how just for our sake of discussion right now, that's how we want to define it. But when we look at miracles, what we want to do is say that there's certain elements to miracles. Right. We want to be able to kind of qualify miracles. So if you were to try and qualify a miracle or or say like for this, for us to say that this is a, a miracle or an act of God. What elements would you want to see happening in this act? And this is a really good practice for us as cops. And, and I'll, I'll say why, and I don't mean to make light of sometimes what is claimed to be miracles, you know, within our rich culture, 
right? And, and I'll give you an example. Like we were, I remember back in my home church growing up, somebody looked up in the dome of the church and saw like some of the way that the ice was like frosting. It was in the middle of winter. I, I grew up in Chicago, was frosting on the window and said, oh, it is St. George, right? It's an apparition of St. George, right? And I'm sure many of us have like, heard like oh we see saint george in the moon or we see different apparitions of saints right and and we very easily call this a miracle right i'm not questioning like what that person is seeing but i'm trying to say like sometimes we can use this term miracle a bit too loosely and so we need to challenge ourselves to say well when we look at miracles in a more objective way what are elements that we should see in a miracle? So probably the first element that we can all kind of agree on is that there is the natural progression of what's possible within mankind, like what humans can do and can't do. Okay. So the first element you immediately recognize is this is something beyond the scope of what a human can reasonably do. So, mm -hmm. you know, um, there's examples where like, you know, the common example, uh, the, the, if a car is running over a newborn child, the mother has enough adrenaline to pick up the car and save the child kind of thing. So I think the first qualification is, can a, can a, can a reasonable person do it? Or even can a human have done the event? So that's kind of like the first baseline the first qualifier okay all right that is it's actually my second point and i'm gonna put that on but i'll uh kind of i'll throw in the first point because you're you're kind of hinting at it anyway is like miracles are supernatural in in nature right they go beyond what we like think or what we know to be able to be possible right and, and you gave that example and kind of by mere fact that they are supernatural, they also are going to transcend or override the laws of nature. They will override the laws of nature. All right? So these are two, like, good elements for us to consider when we think, like, well, what is a miracle and what isn't a miracle? All right? But there's one more element that I want us to highlight, right? Especially when we're thinking about, you know, miracles. I, I think it's I think a miracle is, uh, is, impossible, is impossible to reproduce given any condition, under any condition, so... Okay, it's an irreproducible uh, like, event. Uh, like, uh, say, say it again, sorry? It's, a, it's an irreproducible uh -huh. event. Right, yes. Okay, that's a good one. That's a good one. I didn't, I didn't put that on there, but that's, it's, I would agree. What about like operations of saints, though? That's, pr that's reproducible. Well, I think it can happen again, but like, can we, can we invoke it to happen? I think is the way I kind of understood, you know, Mina's point that it would be irreproducible. It's not like a scientific project where we can, if we are, are trying to produce the same result every time we can get it to happen, right? Miracles don't function like that because they supersede natural laws. Don't they also have to be like, um, like tangible, like something you can see, like the humans could see? Is it, I mean, if people can't really see it, then are they just going to basically rely on the word of mouth? You know, like to the people that were there, you know, saw it. And then they told other people, of course, but, and then others came to see, but like, he didn't just do these miracles in a bubble in a closed place. And then, you know, so it was like viewed or visible to people. Right. That they were able to see this supernatural stuff that was happening. 
You're right. And and that would that would kind of fall under that that uh, second point is it overrides the laws of nature. So like we can appreciate the laws of nature, but for us to appreciate that something is overriding it, like it is something tangible that we would see. Right. And, and, you know, even when you look at back in the 1960s, when St. Mary like appeared on the domes in Zaytun, right. That like, it was witnessed by all, it was irreproducible, but it was something that overrid the natural laws of what we what we knew right it transcends natural law uh, so maybe it has to have a, a purpose like it doesn't just uh happen for no reason like it has to have a purpose so in this case it would have to be some kind of revelation of christ's power or you know there's an end a means to it i i you're right on. Okay. You're right on. And when we look at it, it says, you know, miracles are a part of God's means of revealing his nature and his purpose to us. Because remember how we got into this discussion of miracles, right? His goal while he walked this earth was to prove to people that he was the son of God. He, he used the authority of God in order to forgive sins, but he backed it up by saying what's easier to say forgiven or to say rise up and walk. And he said rise up and walk. So the miracle had a purpose. And the miracle was to reveal God's plan, which what was happening at the time was the revelation of, of, of salvation. Salvation was being unfolded before the eyes of the world. And so the miracles that Jesus did had a purpose behind it. They weren't flashy for no reason. Okay, they were, you know, they were done intentionally. And it was to reveal who he was as the son of God here on earth. Right. So three elements to miracles. They are supernatural. They transcend and override the laws of nature. And they are done with a purpose to reveal God's, you know, um, to reveal God to us. All right. So that's elements of miracles. But now that we kind of have the elements of miracles, we have to defend the miracles, right? Because you can probably find somebody who believes in God or believes in a God, but is skeptical about the miracles recorded in Scripture, right? So when we think about this, this process of defending miracles, first thing we have to do when talking with somebody is really figure out, like, are they a theist or are they an atheist slash naturalist, all right? A theist is somebody who believes in a God, in a higher power, in a supreme being, right? That's a theist. They don't necessarily have to be Christian, but they believe in higher powers, in all supreme being. An atheist doesn't believe in God, so clearly he's not in that camp. And a naturalist is somebody who solely believes in the laws of nature that govern our world. Right, that nothing really supersedes the laws of, of nature. That's a naturalist. Right. Talking to an atheist and a naturalist, that's a whole like different talk, right? Because that, it, it's a loaded conversation. And and before you talk about miracles, you kind of have to talk about uh, the existence of God. So we're not going to go down that route. But let's assume we're talking to a theist because we've probably talked to people in our offices you know, or neighborhood who believe in God, but aren't really ascribing to the Christian faith. And they may read the Bible and, and the things that Christ did and question. So how do we engage somebody, right, who is a theist, but is kind of doubting miracles? Any takers, how do you, how do you make the argument for miracles? Sorry, Buna, what was the question again? I had to step out. Sure. So the question is, in talking to a theist, who is somebody who would believe in a God, not necessarily Jesus Christ as God, but believes in a higher being, but, you know, is, is skeptical of this idea of miracles. So how do we, 
how do we begin to talk to this individual or defend miracles, the idea of miracles? Does the question make sense or no? There's, I mean, I think the first point is say there are no miracles, right? Okay. Because I, I, I think through, like if we're gonna define miracles as, as, as we defined it, it's really, we could call a miracle like God's hand working in our lives, right? Mm -hmm. For example, if, if you have a one in a hundred or a one in a thousand shot at doing something, uh, whether it's a job interview or trying to get an apartment somewhere or you're bidding against something, against some, like say, say you're in a situation where it's like one in a thousand and it's something you've been prayerful about and it's something that you feel like is part of your journey, part of your walk with God. It's a, it's a good thing in your life and you end up getting it. That's, you know, that's God working in your life. Like that could be a miracle. So like, that's, I think that's the first thing we would have to say is, okay, well, when we see how much God helps us on, on our road here on this earth and on this path, you see like, okay, miracles are actually like everywhere. You know, there's like the supernatural events, obviously apparitions and things like that. But then there's also like day-to-day -day stuff. So, so let me get, like, just let's, but if we're, if we're talking to somebody and, and we're saying miracles do exist and we say like, okay, but Jesus was in the middle of the storm and then he calmed the storm or Jesus was in the middle of the desert and had five loaves and two fish and he reproduced it in order to feed, you know, at least 5,000 men, likely like eight to 10,000 people total. So like, so like, you mean like ancient miracles or like modern day? I mean, like, I mean, let's start off with the ancient because that's what is at hand. And our, you know, one of our main focuses like right now is, is, is we're, we're really taking a look at, at Christ, you know, and I think, yes, the pre like the day-to-day -day miracles that we can ex establish or experience are nice, but they are they are very challengeable with respect to are they supernatural and do they transcend the laws of nature, right? They become very, very subjective in, in that realm. I, you know, I guess what I wanted to say is like when you, when you marry these two ideas of the day-to-day, -day, you know, God is with you and helping you and you, you see his intervention along with the miracles we see on earth. Now imagine the opposite. Like when there's like, say, if there's no intervent, like if there's no uh, influence of God on this earth, right, then all you're doing is praying to an idea which you can't see, feel or experience. So to the theist, I would I would challenge them to go that route and to quest, you know, like, OK, go with your assumptions, say there are no miracles, right? Say everything is chaos and random, then then. Uh, then where's the meaning behind your relationship with God? You know, if you don't have movement from God's hand, then how are you interacting with him? Then you're, you know, it's just an idea to think about, you know. I think you're really close. That miracle. Sorry, go ahead. Uh-huh. No, no, go ahead. Finish up. Just, just, yeah, just, just that miracles are, are the event uh, and the activities of the divine. And that if you remove that from the earth, then, and you don't have any activity from the divine and everything is just carried on this like link of events of humanity and mankind or whatever, then what's the purpose of being theistic? How is, you know, what, what is, what is, um, what is your meaning and purpose behind your worship of your theism? You know, anyway, just, it was just a question. No, no, I, I think you're actually like, 
really on the right trail because if somebody believes that there is a, a powerful God out there, right, then immediately just in that thought, you open up the door to just this simple idea is, are miracles possible, right? Because one, once you bring God into the picture of it, and once we say that there is an all-powerful God out there, then we are opening this idea of, are miracles possible, right? And somebody who believes that there is a God kind of naturally is going to believe that miracles are possible because it would fall under the ability of an all-powerful God to interact and an all-powerful God who would want to communicate, right? So when we open that door or that idea with, with somebody who's, who's like really searching for this idea of, of who God, like, is there a God and who is he and all these things, right? That's our first step. But then like the beautiful thing, which really goes back to our first couple of uh, first two sessions is, okay, if we believe in this idea that miracles are possible and they are possible because we do believe in a supreme God, right? Then the next question is, okay, then, well, let's look at the New Testament documents. And we ask ourselves like, are they reliable? Because if we're going to say that like, you know, the New Testament and, and we gave our reasons as to why we look at the New Testament documents as being reliable documents, right? Then it, it kind of like says, are miracles possible? Yes. How do we, you know, where, where can we find miracles? They're in the New Testament, right? Are these documents reliable? Yes. Why are they reliable? Okay, is kind of leads us to the next question. Well, are the New Testament witnesses reliable as well? Right. And, and that's why, like, it's really important for us to study the Bible from, you know, a bit of a bird's eye view, if you will. Sometimes we just look at the Bible from, like, after being indoctrinated in, in the faith since birth. We just take it verbatim, which is, it's a good thing, but at a certain point, like we need to challenge ourselves to kind of take a step back and, and think logically and say like, well, what's beyond, this is what I've known and grown up with. And this is what I've heard over and over in church and Sunday school and all these things. Like, is there a logical argument as to why I would believe in the New Testament and believe in the four gospels of the New Testament, which capture the miracles? And so, like, when we talk to people, right, we should be able to hopefully, like, answer these questions like, okay, well, if you believe in a God, then miracles are possible. And miracles are recorded in the New Testament. Historically, are these documents, you know, reliable? If so, yes. How, why and how are they reliable? Because they're eyewitnesses. And how reliable are these eyewitnesses? Well, they match up with other outside sources. Um, and they are different than Gnostic Gospels, which portray him differently. So going through all these exercises really empowers us in these conversations to really stand up and say, like, yeah, I believe it. And this is why. And here's my line of, of logic for, understand, for, for believing in this. Right. So miracles are really important because miracles are one of the you know, key ways that Christ himself revealed to the people of his time and the people of today that truly he was the son of God. And then the last way that he did that is looking at this idea of prophecies, which was, which was talked about in the video. And is, it's such a powerful argument as well as far as who Jesus Christ really is. And I'm going to skip this verse just for the sake of time, all right? But I do want to, you know, I, I don't know if you guys can, can read the, the signs, but up here are 17, actually, not 16, but these are 17 prophecies from the Old Testament, right? He would be born of a virgin. He would be born in Bethlehem. He would be mocked and scorned and whipped. 
the time of his birth was predicted. He would come from the seed of a woman. He would be a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and David. He would come from the tribe of Judah. He would heal the deaf and blind. He would be rejected by his own people, the Jews. He would teach with parables. Kings and rulers would plot to kill him. He would be betrayed by close friends. He would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. His disciples would be scattered. His bones would remain unbroken. He would be burned, buried in a rich man's grave. He would be resurrected on the third day. These are Old Testament prophecies, right? And these are prophecies that are very, very clearly directed at who at the coming Messiah, right? Which when we look at was fulfilled by Jesus Christ. And it's an awesome like practice in mathematics, which I have no idea how they actually calculate it. Where just to give like a sense, like if just eight prophecies, so I left eight prophecies up there, right? If eight prophecies like these were coming true by the sheer chance, okay, Sorry, if eight of these were to come to, to be true, just by sheer chance, okay, that one person was born and filled, fulfilled eight of these prophecies, what are the chances? One in 10 to the seven, the power of 17, right? And those are all the zeros. This is, I love this imagery. That would be equivalent to covering the whole state of Texas with silver dollars, two feet deep, than expecting a blindfolded man to walk across the state and on the very first try find the one coin you marked, right? That's the probability of one person fulfilling eight Old Testament prophecies, right? What if we add in another eight, okay? If we were to add only eight more similar prophecies for a total of 16, the odds would be one times 10 to the 28th times 10 to the 17th, or one to the power of 40, one in 10 to the 45th power, right? And if you add in 45 prophecies, it's one times 10 to the 157th power. And there are dozens and dozens of prophecies that were fulfilled by Jesus Christ. And so the chances of this being random, that Jesus Christ fulfilling all these Old Testament prophecies, it's, it's slim to none, right? It's not happening. The chances, like the mathematical calculation of it doesn't add up. And so we shouldn't be thinking like, oh, like, but it could happen. No, like, no scientist is going to like bet his life's work on, on odds like this, right? And so we shouldn't be betting our faith on odds like this either. We should be very confident in this idea that truly Jesus Christ was the coming Messiah. I'm going to end it off with this quote, right? For a few of the prophecies, yes. That's certainly conceivable that Jesus could have intentionally fulfilled them, as some claim. But there are many others for which this just wouldn't have been possible. For instance, how would he control the fact that the Sanhedrin offered Judas 30 pieces of silver to betray him? How could he arrange for his ancestry or to be born when and where he was, or his method of execution, or the soldiers gambling for his clothing, or that his legs remain unbroken on the cross? How would he arrange to perform miracles in front of skeptics, right? So it just wasn't going to happen by chance. And so I'm hoping now, like kind of after three sessions of, of kind of studying the Bible from a more of a critical standpoint and asking ourselves, like, who is this person that we all claim to be Jesus Christ, the son of God? And is there beyond like just our upbringing as Coptic Orthodox individuals, beyond just our upbringing, are, is there good grounds for us to confidently share that truly he is the son of God?
And it is so important for us to be able to confidently say, yes, he is the son of God for, and we list our reasons. Because we live in a world that is very, very becoming very anti-Christian. We also live in a world where the, the number of people who are not ascribing to any sort of religious belief or Christianity is increasing exponentially. You know, Christianity is looked at like a mythological fairy tale that is there to give hope to the weak. But when we look critically at the Gospels, at Scripture, at the New Testament, at who Jesus was, how did he teach, the miracles that he performed, the prophecies he fulfilled, the outside historical, you know, evidence that support who he is as an individual, it should give us a great deal of confidence. And we are really going to need that confidence, especially when it comes to the key, key, you know, declaration of our faith, that Jesus Christ rose from the dead, right? So this whole buildup over the last three weeks is because the is is to really hopefully give us a strong foundation in order to declare without reservation that he rose from the dead right and next week we're going to take a look at the ev evidence for the resurrection and we're going to do it in in a very similar fashion to what we've been doing these last three weeks we will look for the evidence of the resurrection any questions I have a comment, not a question. Yeah. Go for it. Can you hear me? Hello? Yeah. Uh, yeah, okay, I can hear you. Yeah, no, I wanted to just add one little thing. Sure. Um, when you were talking about authority before, mm -hmm. so the authority to forgive the sins, but um, I think an, another big factor that, you know, would under authority would be that, um, and this is from a book by Bishop Gregorius called you know, about the man born blind. He was saying, who has the authority to create eyes when there were none except God himself? Because mm -hmm. he didn't just open the, the man's eyes. He actually took the dirt and he kind of did the same motion that he did when he created Adam. He, he created it from dirt. Like, and he put them and then he, you know, he blew and all that. So that, that's a big deal. <laughs> I mean, that's like, you know, I mean, if the guy had like nothing, it was sealed and everybody sees now that he's got eyeballs. <laughs> I mean, you know, that he created it. It, it wasn't there. So, mm -hmm. I mean, and God's the only one that has that authority over creation. I mean, I don't think even the disciples had that, you know, where they could create limbs or something they could heal people you know and and do other things like you know yeah. like the, the fish and you know all that but i mean i mean to your point like even when we look at the disciples like as they went and they performed miracles after the ascension and after pentecost they always did the miracles in the name of jesus christ right so they they knew that they're their ability to perform the miracle was rooted in the authority of who Jesus Christ was, right? Um, so you see that, but you're right to, to, to your point about Jesus creating eyes out of nothing, right? It shows who he is as God, God incarnate, um, because the our understanding and belief of, of creation was that creation of of the world was done out of nothing right no like we can read in genesis or it says the earth was without form and 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 um was was void and without form sorry i can't like pull the exact wording of it like we think that there was something there for him to work with but but truly when we dig deeper into into the translations like it is he created out of nothing there was nothing there and he began to create and that is you know, very important because it shows who he is as God. No one else can create out of nothing. Um, 
Yeah. All right. I'm going to ask. Uh, so there's two questions I want to ask is I have an idea like so there is a movie off of the book Case for Christ. All right. And I think it would be very cool for us after the conclusion of the series, which will be next week to watch the movie together. Um, and maybe even have a discussion. And my thought was to do it at church on Saturday from like five to seven before Vespers. Um, we have plenty of space in the basement. We can all spread out, but that's an idea. So you kind of want your feedback with respect to that. Um, if you would be up for that, not, I don't know how it would work if we tried to do it virtually. Thoughts? Yay, nay. Anybody out there? I even take an emoji with a thumbs up. Hi, everyone. This is Danny. I figured I'd jump in. I, I, I would love to, but I just, I won't be here on that Saturday. So um, if it was virtual, I can remote in and, and watch it if someone does a screen share, but uh, that's just my thoughts. I don't know how a screen share would work for a movie, um, but, and it wouldn't be next Saturday. It would be like, we'd finish up oh, next the following Saturday. Okay. Maybe the Saturday after. But I got one. Challenge. If I'm in, if I'm in town, definitely would would attend. Yeah. All right. So I got kind of two yays. All right. If you're still thinking about that one, the other thing is, so we are going to end next week, and I want to know from you all, what should our next Bible study series be? Any votes? Thoughts. Can we think about it and get back to you this week? You can, but if anybody has an immediate thought right now, I'm open. Please be thinking about it and either let me know throughout the week or um, or shoot me an email or next week when we get together, I will ask again um, so we can pick that out. All right, I'm going to close this in prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. We thank you, Lord, for all your blessings. We thank you for this day and this time together. I pray, Lord, that you continue to um, challenge us to see our faith um critically and and to be confident that it does um, that you have given us a very reasonable and credible faith um, and we thank you lord for that and we pray that you would guide us as we enter into our last uh topic next week as um on your resurrection through the intercessions of all your saints who have pleased you from the beginning here says we say our father who art in heaven be thy name.